Check, check, check one, two. About to get this Q&A started here with Dave Faison up in the house. Don't have anybody watching yet, so we can say whatever we want. Oh, we got somebody on the hook. We got somebody here. That is great. Welcome, you two viewers. We're gonna have a very fun Nano Reef discussion here with Dave Faison of Nanobox Reef. What's going on, guys? So uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? I'm Dave Faison. I'm the owner of Nanobox Reef, the only person currently working for Nanobox Reef. <laughs> I'm out here uh, visiting Reef Builders headquarter uh, with Jake, doing a little fishing, doing a little bit of reefing, and checking out a bunch of the stores. So here we are. Very cool. So um, we went and saw a bunch of stores over the last couple of days. Uh, tell us about your, your tour in the Denver area. Yeah, so we went to five different stores and then a reptile store and a bird store today, which was pretty cool. Um, the first of the stores was Aquatic Art, which is pretty incredible being able to see, um, you know, a guy that practices basically in like stony corals and whatnot. Um, some of the best stuff I've seen in a while. I don't have anything like that at the house. Um, then we went to Neptune's, which seemed like an old school shop, which was neat to see, kind of like a blast from the past. Yeah. And then um, the giant hammer coral. That's right. And then today um, it was a little rainy, so it was nice, nice day to reef. And uh, checked out a few other stores. The Stone, was it Stone? Stone Aquatics, yeah. Yep. So that was wild to see. It, it, basically a giant warehouse with a bunch of exotic fish. Um, and then we saw Aquamart, which was really nice. I think that was probably the one that impressed me the most uh, with just their displays and everything that they had as far as like how they display the product and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a good day. We got to see a whole bunch. Very cool. So, um, you know, we talk a lot about reef tanks and the aquarium hobby in very general terms. Um, but there's definitely like a lot of new chapters of the reef aquarium hobby yeah. that are fleshing out to be their own little world. And um, so I, Dave's an old buddy of mine, and so he's yep. teaching me how to fly fish. We did some lake fishing and some uh, rapid river fishing at the yeah. same time. Caught a bunch of brookies and trout and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, some brown trout and brookies. It was a good time. Um, but. Uh, to expensify the uh, fly fishing trip, yes. we need to work. So this is us working right now, talking to you guys. So we're going to have a, a discussion here, um, a little bit focused on nano reef tanks. And uh, yeah, so this is a Q&A. Since we have two people, while one of us is answering a question, the other one of us can check out your questions. Um, so thanks everybody for joining in. Definitely type your questions down in the comments and we will take turns checking them out and try to engage you in this discussion. And uh, yeah, so uh, so any, it, it, it doesn't go without saying that anytime you're, you're having some kind of a in-depth discussion to lay a good foundation. Yeah. So in order to clarify, because there's always some newbies around that maybe aren't super sure uh, what we're talking about. Yep. So we want to lay the groundwork. What is a nano reef tank? So I think a nano reef tank to me is kind of like a, in my opinion, a tank under 40 gallons, realistically. Um, and then I would say there's another classification with a Pico yeah. tank. And to me, I, I, I like to say a Pico tank's under eight gallons. Yeah. Um, it and seems it's, like it's a golden. It's arbitrary yeah, yeah. to a degree. So my, my first saltwater tanks were a 29 gallon tank and a 30 gallon tank. I set up two yeah. tanks at the same time. So for me, those were normal sized tanks. Yeah. And then the first tanks that I had that I considered nano, were like the 10 to 15 gallon range. Yep. And over time, my personal cutoff for nano is 29 gallons. Okay. It's just a 30 gallon to me, that's just a normal tank. Yeah. And if you have a 29 gallon tank, you might have a bunch of rock, you might have a filter section cutting down your actual volume to yeah. 20 gallon. And then a Pico Reef, my definition of a Pico Reef is a tank that you can comfort, comfortably pick up, water and all. And it usually falls about seven or eight gallons. Because right. you know, a five gallon full of water, that's a five gallon bucket, you can pick that up. Yeah. You know, but in general, we kind of know. We kind of know what we're talking about. Yeah. Right? A Nano Reef or a Pico Reef. We've set up a few. Yeah. Yeah. 
So what's really interesting is I worked in the retail aquarium space for a long time. And the first thing we always told people who were interested in getting a saltwater tank, get the biggest tank you can afford. Yep. Not just the glass, but everything else. Because we thought a larger tank was gonna actually going to be easier to take care of because this is before reefs dominated the whole scene. Yeah. Right? And I think it was easier too, or not as easy because of the equipment. Yeah, you know, especially the equipment very and all that. So it's funny how over time we realized that there's certain things about nano reefs that are way easier. Yep. It's way easier to put bright lights on a nano tank. Mm -hmm. It's way easier to put reasonable flow on a nano tank. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, it's funny how the retail scene yeah. pushed, pushed people away from nanos forever and ever and ever. Yeah. You know what? I think that in some European trade shows, um, you are not allowed to have nano reefs with fish. You can have nano reefs with shrimp, with invertebrates. And I don't know if that's an, a European Union thing, but they don't even understand that maybe some of these nano tanks are actually better yeah. for the animals sometimes. Yeah, you can do a specific type of tanks, biotopes, you know, a bunch of different things, a whole lot easier than you know something that's 100 gallons, and then you make a giant mistake, and it's a whole lot of money yeah. you know, out the window. And, just makes it a whole lot easier, I think, setting up a, a smaller tank. Um, your wife won't be upset with you with yeah. you know, how much money you're spending on it. And you can also try some new things out, which is which is really fun. Yeah, you know, especially with the nano tanks, it's great for a counter. Yeah. Great for a desk. Yeah, any type of office. Great for a dresser. Yep. Uh, so yeah, we're really just gonna dive into nano reefs and geek out over some nano tanks. Yeah. Um, we're probably gonna be here for you know, a solid hour, so. We are enjoying some uh, Pinner throwback IPAs yes. uh, from Oscar Blues. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, cheers. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, definitely let us know in the, the comments what your questions are. And um, let's see. So what we're going to do, we're just going to bounce back and forth. Yep. So it, you know, say we, we took a time machine like 15 years back, and people are just keeping normal mini reef aquariums. Because yep. that's what they were all called before. All reef tanks were mini reefs. How is a nano tank different from a normal reef tank? How would you how would you describe that to somebody I, from the past? I, not, not from today. Not from today. Yeah. Um, or you could just answer the question straightforward. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would just say it's a you it's much more intimate. You know, ah, like, that's such a good answer. Yeah. yeah. You can really get down. You know, you can see the exact coral. You can really get close to it. You're not like lost in this giant puzzle of you know rock and corals and then corals growing on top of corals you can really see how things react and um you know i think one of my favorite things is be able to see that but also some of the smaller species of invertebrates and um, some of the fish out there getting to see them actually interact with certain corals or certain anemones or with each other, there's there's so many different options, but I would say it's just more intimate than, that's not, than anything else. That's not the answer I was expecting because I was yeah. thinking more like from a technical point of view. Yeah. But that's a better. Yeah. That's a better answer. Okay. Because earlier we a couple days ago we, we were discussing about big tanks, big peninsula tanks. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have these dreams of having a giant reef tank, and I don't want a giant reef tank. I'd rather have three large reef tanks. And we were talking about this intimacy issue yep. that when the tank gets so big. The corals are far away, your fish are far away, there's corners of the reef that you never get to see or pay attention to. Um, so, so yeah, for me there's definitely like, I, w I don't see myself ever having a thousand gallon reef tank. No. Maybe a 500 peninsula where I could see all around it. Yep. But yeah, that, is, that was a really good answer. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. really, it, yeah, because it's more like an emotional, you know, how yeah. are, are nano reef tanks different? Yeah, there's, I um, mean, you just, or how? You ask me the question again? No, no. Oh no. Say whatever you want. Man. Yeah, no, I just think it's um it's just much more personal too, you know. I think you can you can make a nano reef look better um in the space that you have as far as like aesthetics go as well. Um, I think some of the setups nowadays you can buy a you know, a small innovative marine all-in-one tank, or you can buy a uh, cab lights all-in-one tank, and you know, everything like that, put it on the side of the desk, and then it also looks great next to it. You know, the, it kind of completes the room, and um, I think it's just really interesting to see how people are starting to get into the aesthetic side of nano reefs, instead of just setting it up and making it look like a science project, or 
or who knows what. Right. Um, I know it's, it's really cool to see it, and then of course equipment and everything's really progressing. So. Yeah, you know, we, there's an explosion of all-in-one tanks available right now. Yep. I don't even think we've seen the the golden age. No, I think no. we're like we're in the, leading into it, yeah. leaning into it. Like we you said, a bleeding edge. Yeah, you know, yeah. Teeter totter, but we, we've got a while before perfect, really turnkey all-in-one yep. for nano tanks are available. Um, but I want to address a couple questions we had in the comments. So Philip uh, Tanel said he just did his uh, first ICP test with Triton. Congrats! This is a really great thing to do. Um, you mentioned that you had elevated super high levels of zinc. So I'm not sure what that is. I want. I think natural seawater level is two or four parts per billion, and um, I actually usually have a hard time keeping my zinc up. So I'm gonna guess that you probably had a contamination along the way. Zinc is actually good for corals. Um, maybe you could tell us in the comments what your actual level was, because if it's four or five, it might be might be fine. Um, but five parts per billion would be twice natural seawater level. So I wouldn't worry about that one too much. If you really want to take it out, I think a polyfilter is selected for heavy metals, so that shouldn't be a problem. And then uh, this question I'm going to pose to you uh, first. Uh, do these vase Pico reefs work with just air pumps? Post, uh, posted by Vander Ural. Vander Ural. So what do you think? You've seen these vase Pico reefs, right? Yeah. And um, I guess I haven't seen how they are being operated, but they're saying they're running uh, just by an air pump. What do you think? Um, I've seen that before. It's there's a couple tanks on um, a couple forums that I follow. I've seen do that. I I don't think it's probably the most or probably easiest way um, of doing it. I would say more so of maybe just putting a small you know circular or just a small pump of some sort in there where it's uh, mixing up the surface or surface you know getting good agitation. Um, but in my opinion, I probably wouldn't just use an air pump. Uh, See, I'm going to go old school okay. and, d and definitely say that that is totally fine. Because mm -hmm. old school, all freshwater tanks, you know, up until 1960s and 1970s, everything was air driven. Yeah. You know, when I set up all these racks right here, it's yep. one air pump driving everything. And such a small tank, little bubbles, yep. they'll, they'll mix the heck out of that tank. Okay. And, and for some reason, the pressurized air, remember we were talking about partial pressure the yep. other day, it actually injects a pretty good amount of oxygen. Okay. Probably the biggest drawback is going to be salt creep. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and added uh, evaporation. Yep. Um, it's, which is really critical to a nano tank or a pico tank. Not going to get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Um, but if there's no fish or only one teeny tiny fish, I think it'd be all right. Wait, wait, wait. But uh, it's not something to recommend. No. It's I an experiment, a toy, you know, something to play with. Yeah, it's it's really hard. Like Jake said, the salinity is a big thing, and um, there's not really an easy way even to add what a Auto, auto top off of any sort. Oh yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the micro pico reefs are yeah. very hands on. They're not, uh, you know, unless you have a climate controlled room. So it's not practical to have like a heater on it and a water level sensor and, and all the things. Yep. So, all Let's right. See. What else do we have here? Um, cool. I think uh, I think we might be ready to jump into the deep end of the pool. Yeah. This is really easy though. So. How oh, did you get into reef tanks, my man? Because I don't even know. Yeah, I um, I got into reef tanks with, there's a store locally that had some neat corals and I went in there a few times. And then I started searching online. I've always liked really small things. So it's been really, I used to make small clay objects. I used to do small paintings. I used to do all these different small activities. So I was really attracted to like the small reef tank. So I started looking up nano reefs, and nanoreef.com, um, a forum came up, and there was a particular um, member on there that had a three-gallon surge tank. Um, so it was like one and a half gallons and then one and a half gallons above, and it would surge, you know, two or three times a day. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, so my first tank was a custom acrylic tank, and um, it had its downfalls and good moments too but that's really how how it all started um just enjoyed seeing the corals and uh instead of doing i call it kind of like a, a man's garden is what a, mm. a reef tank can kind of be you know you're inside and growing these corals i just i thought it was the neatest thing that brings um, me to a good point i want to welcome any of the ladies yeah. that are watching right now yep. the aquarium hobby 
the reef aquarium hobby is poorer from your absence. Please, ladies, we need to see more uh, feminine style reef tanks with less gadgets and gizmos and more observation of detail. Yeah. And there's a lot more we can learn from each other. So uh, please, everybody that's watching right now, do what you can to uh, encourage and motivate your mothers, your sisters, your wives, your daughters. Um, to get a reef tank or to even to appreciate it, you know, take them to the fish store, let them yeah. pick out a fish, let them pick out a coral. Let them name them. Try yeah, not to grit yeah. your teeth when the first thing they pick out is a puffer. Yeah. <laughs> Just calmly explain to them why you can't put it in your tank and yeah. then tell them the same thing for a seahorse. Yes. <laughs> okay, so ladies are welcome. Yes. Man's garden, everybody's garden. So, yeah, nano reef tanks, man, they are so much fun. You can just do all kinds of different concepts. Yep. Um, but, but man, you're really, you're, you're a, a special animal, you know? You've been making LED lights. You're one of the few companies that literally makes them in USA. Yep. You're one of the few that makes, hand makes them, you know, as much as that can be um, done by hand. Yep. Um, it's very crafty, you know, you, your, the lights that you make, really fall into the slipstream of the craft movement. Yep. So pick a point of telling us how you started making LED lights and yeah, to explain the, the beginnings of Nanobox Reef. Yeah, so Nanobox Reef really started with um, me being interested in building a better looking light. So I, I really thought all lights were pretty ugly. You know, metal halides were these giant reflectors over your tank, T5s, you know, like the sun powers and whatnot, they were getting sleeker, but still it's like this monstrosity of a unit. Um, so I started to teach myself how to build LED lights. So was uh, your original intent just to make a light for yourself? Yeah, so I started building lights for myself and then uh, people on the message boards started to message me to buy them. Um, so I was really surprised at first, didn't really know how to take it, so I'd sell it and then make another one, and they just kept on getting better and a little bit smaller. And then I um, I found a, you know, kind of like a hyper niche in the nano world for this custom aquarium lighting. And once that happened, um, it just kept on snowballing from there. So the lights, you know, were kind of looked like a T5 light, but they were smaller. There wasn't that much control. Just kept on going from there. I started learning about machining, um, CNC work. A few other of the uh, industry people actually helped me out, which was really, really helpful. Um, Nano Tuners was a big one. Chris over there at CNC Reef uh, really taught me a lot as well, and he actually still machined some of the stuff for me in the States. So it comes down to this. This is the newest uh, generation of lights. Um, you can see it. this one is the Mini Tide uh, which is really small, nice and compact. Most people don't know how small it is until they really get to see it in person. This has the gooseneck already on there, but you can see the, the footprint of the um, light's tiny. So it just looks really good over the light. So uh, one table. thing that the camera cannot capture is that this, this is unibody. This is unibody just like our MacBooks that we have here. Yep. And so it's interesting that no other company is doing an all aluminum unibody design. They're all awesome. Cost too much. They're all going with plastic, uh, you know, housings with yep. uh, aluminum heat sinks inside. But you um, pioneered this design and you stuck with it. Yeah. And what's really cool about that is it turns the entire fixture into a heat sink. Exactly. And that's why you can get away with such a tiny little fan. Yep. So yeah, the the fans and everything have stayed primarily really small. Um, also, with all the you know the heat sinking fans go through here. And then there's the venting on the side. So the fan stays pretty darn quiet um, for how small the heat sink actually is with the fan. Um, so yeah, it's a cool design. It, it really looks nice. Uh, it's very Apple-like. One of my favorite old Apple products was the first Nano. Mac Mini? No, 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 the um, iPod Nano. Oh, yes. So oh, yeah, this totally looks like yeah, an iPod see? Nano. It, so, you know, just hold it in your hand. It, yep. it really has that feel and those curves and everything. Yeah, the curves are there. The old Nano actually was um, it was a shell. It's the iPod it's Mini. Sorry, mini. iPod Mini. Okay. They, the Nano they made for a long time, but the Mini was yep. the first one. I came in with some colors. It wasn't quite this big, but uh, yeah, I totally see yeah. the iPod so Mini in this it. one. So that's, um, that was, I was really influenced by that, obviously. 
Um, so the design started as an extrusion, and then a heat sink actually slid inside of it. And then now it transformed into this unibody, like Jake said, um, which is really nice and universal as well because there's lid options. So going into the customization side of what Nanobox can do, obviously this unit is green and then black. Um, say your wife hated that and you had you know, white walls and then hardwood floors. What we can do is actually do a white body and then do like cherry or walnut or bamboo or something to match what you need. Um, then of course it makes, you know, happy wife, happy wife. All right. And I think it goes for your fish tank. So, so the other thing that's also super interesting about the Nanobox Reef line is that it's evolved a lot over time. The, the, the overall design has stayed um, superficially the same, yep. while the innards have, have changed a lot, the drivers have changed a lot, yep. the wireless control has been enacted. The first one I had, did it have knobs on it? You actually had to use a screwdriver. Oh, you yeah, had a screwdriver, that's and right. The you go the screw, the oh my goodness, I totally forgot about that one. It's come a long way. But no, so the, the thing that's really cool is um, nearly all the fixtures, you know, most of their light is coming from Cree LEDs. And um, um, maybe like a little bit of the blue, or the deep blue in uh, UV would be coming up from uh, EpiLED or, or semi -LED. LED. And um, uh, a few other exotics. But you, have, from, from early, early on, um, you kind of went with the Philips, yep. right? And this is like uh, Samsung, Apple, right? Android, iOS. Yep. They're doing the same things, but very slightly different. Yep. And one thing I remember, and that I still haven't really experienced yeah. with a lot of other fixtures, is um, just, it, you know, you have blue and royal blue from Cree, yep. you have blue and royal blue from Philips, they both look amazing, they don't look the same. No. And in, in my opinion, the Philips are just shifted over like 10 nanometers, and they just, it just looks a little brighter, looks a little poppier. Yeah. The um, Philips doesn't get as purple as the Cree. No, there is, it's kind of like a, a give and take, Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I prefer the Philips line. Obviously, I've been using it for you know six years or so. Um, so d d before you answer that question, yeah, yeah. when you started going down the path, obviously Cree was making most of the noise. What made you decide to go Philips when so, everybody was going Cree? Yeah, so there was a um, there was actually a company in town that I was. Hey, what town was that? Greensboro, North Carolina. Yeah, because he was amazing on the other yeah. coast. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's a company that was in Charlotte, North Carolina that I worked with for a while and the Philips line is all that they use. So it was a um, easy learning lesson. He kind of explained everything that they do and I really thought the uh, color rendition of all of the different colors that Philips make was more preferred for reef aquariums. So, Long story short, started playing around with the original Rebels, then it went to the new Rebel ES, and now we have the T's, the M's, the C's, and they're all great LEDs. Um, another color besides the Royal Blue that you're mentioning, I believe the uh, Philips line also has a better white rendition than what Cree does. Um, their CRI seem more realistic, which is just a makes a white LED look better. That's the easiest way to describe it. Uh, but when you mix all these colors together, I felt that it was more uniform than what I was able to get out of Cree. Um, so yeah, I've kind of stuck with it for now. One thing I do remember is like, to, you know, Cree was always pushing the brightness, yeah. you know, lumens per watt, and for there's a period of two years where like every month they had a press release of how many lumens per watt they were pushing yeah. and pushing and pushing. But Philips, they were pushing the uh, lumens per watt more efficacy in the color exactly. LEDs, and yeah. so their game was always a little bit stronger. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, you know, it's uh, well, yeah, the Royal Blues were up until pretty recently, like a year and a half ago, were actually brighter than any Cree Royal Blue LED. Uh, the amount of power that you pushed to it yeah. um, for a bit. So, yeah. Um, okay, and so right along that same train of thought. Um, you haven't been shy about experimenting with some exotic LED colors. Yeah. And it seemed like maybe three or four years ago, there was kind of a rash of companies that were putting out lights that had um, doped 
whites, yep. right? White LEDs, and they were doped with a little bit of phosphor. Can you explain what that is real quick before you talk about these um, these funky well, colors? Or you're saying doped, do you mean like... It was um, just like a white with just like a tiny bit of blue or a tiny bit of this. They were just like tinted. Yeah, so sometimes what you can see too is um, on like the lower CRI LEDs, you'll see kind of like a greenish tint sometimes too on the angles. Mm -hmm. Some have less blue, so whenever you buy LEDs, they come in like a big film looking roll and they're, they're bin specifically for a certain color. Um, so what a lot of companies did before is they just, they found basically the highest power, which doesn't mean that it's gonna look the best over a tank, but it would also maybe put too much green in the tank or too much yellow or too much blue with the white. And then when you mix the two colors together, it would just kind of look washed out. You know, you hear that about LEDs kind of being Icy or too icy or washed yeah. out, just not so preferred. So you were probably one of the first to have warm whites in your fixtures. Yeah, um, I think you had warm whites in your fixture before Max Spec. The first one, the yeah. first commercial unit I could think of, was probably the Max Spec Razor. Yep. But you had it before that. Yeah. I so this is the, the the thing that's beautiful about the craft movement is that you know he's not trying to please like thousands of thousands of people. You're trying to make a light that you love. Yeah. And that you think will be cool. And you're constantly, constantly um, interacting with your customers and your users, trying to, you know, to, trying to experiment in, in, in interesting ways. Yeah. Because like a lot of these doped uh, LEDs that were funky colors, I feel like they came and they went. There's exactly. no more no more fixtures that use these doped, yeah. slightly tinted LEDs. I think there's so much information too online where people can go look and they see that, hey, this thing doesn't look too good. Why would I buy it? Right. So I think companies had to progressively, you know, you know, they wanted to change things for what the customers really wanted. Uh, more and more people are getting uh, better knowledge about lighting in general because there is so much info. There's a lot of bad info. Yeah. Um, but it, there is good info out there, and I think a lot of the companies took that to heart and started changing stuff. So one one of the first exotic LED colors that you played with was lime. Yep. What was that like? And do you still use it? So I recently changed the lime channel for the, new. Uh, well, yeah, well, so well I lime. changed it. Yeah. So the, the lime, lime question. So first. I started. Um, lime came out, and it was a really cool LED color. Um, was it, it was it like a white green? Yeah, it was a whitish green. That's the best way to real, explain it. Real bright green. Though. Yep, very very bright green. Um, but what happened is when you mix that lime with the other colors you didn't have as much of the color separation or ah, color shadow. That's super important. When yep. you have some of these exotic colors and that disco ball effect is at play in the shimmer in our yep. tanks, sometimes, that's right, the lime just, it was too noticeable in the disco lines. So yeah. That's what it was. So there's that, but also it, um, without you know white LEDs, sometimes when you mix the two of them together with all the other blues, it can look very dim. Mm. So there was an issue with that, and I always thought it was a big issue. So with these lime LEDs, it would brighten up the tank without really affecting the color temperature. So what would happen, you would have a tank that almost looked like a T5 tank rather than um, a traditional LED tank. Right. So, yeah. so some people are just joining us, and it's just so funny because at the beginning we discussed what is a nano tank, yeah. and now it's going back and forth. That he said, you said what forty gallons was like on your max. Yeah, yeah. See, to me, that's like normal. I had so many forty gallon tanks, and they had normal filters, and I had normal this and that. Yeah. For my personal one is twenty nine gallons. Thirty gallons a normal tank, twenty nine gallon. Once you subtract yeah. the rock and maybe filter space, you might be working with twenty gallons of volume. So this cutoff is forty minus twenty nine, but it's so arbitrary. It really, really doesn't matter. Um, okay, so we were just talking about limes, and um, you, oh, so what's your new color? What's the new color that you're into? Yeah, so the new color I've been playing with is mint, um, which sounds ridiculous. It, it sounds, yeah. it sounds uh, very uh, Starbucks. Oh, yeah. It sounds like very something, venti. You, you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something you throw on a product to, to push it. But tell us what mint is and how is it different from lime? Um, so the mint color has, for you LED geeks, um, it has a good spike, or it starts to rise around like 405, 410 nanometers, and then it starts to creep up around 420 and 425, which most violets are. Then it peaks back down, and then it has a small little um, blue spike, 
and then the yellow screen that makes it bright, kind of like the line. So the line had the same light graph, but it uh, didn't have that spike in the violet-ish mm -hmm. color. Um, so this one, in my opinion, just blends a hundred times better than what the line even did. So I've been experimenting with my own personal reef for over a year now with no white lights and only mixing mint to supplement a white look. Mm. Um, to give it like that 14K, 20K look. So, so far it's, it looks great. I mean, I've had it up for a year. Um, I have SPS, LPS, anything, and it's all doing very well, which is still really taboo for, uh, you know, reef tanks, everybody, says, oh, you gotta have white, you gotta use this, but no, it's, it's, um, I think it's the number one cause for uh, LED failures, you know, people just not liking LEDs or saying Not, not the technical failure of the LED, yeah. but just the improper application of spectrum programming for the fixture, which we're gonna come back around to that. Yeah. Um, but one last, um, I guess, pioneering thing that I wanna you know, bring up, actually somebody talked about it in the comments, some major manufacturers are starting to experiment with yeah. it, is um, a diffuser film. Yeah. You had a diffuser film. You sent me some, must have been 2011, 2012. Six years ago, five yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. You sent me a little film on my, my first nano box and put it on there, and then future nano boxes came on it. Yep. So you tell, tell us people about um, kind of the diffuser effect. So the diffuser will... Um, what is it? It's like a, I mean, it looks, what's the best way to describe it? Um, basically it's a, like a sheet, you can also buy your acrylic this way, um, where it almost looks like it has a rough surface, mm -hmm. um, but what it's doing is it's allowing the colors to all mend together better, yeah. um, much like a, best way to describe it, it's like a T5 light in my opinion, it's a little more muted, you don't get the shimmer. So you obviously lose a little bit of par, because you're, you're losing some of that directionality. Yep. But um, you get that much more diffuse effect. It, yep. it kills the disco ball effect. Exactly. It kills really your glimmer lines if you really like that. A good amount, yeah. But if I had to compare it to something, it's like privacy window film, right? Yep. So it's similar. I mean, there's all different kinds of films and plastics available yep. from 3M and other companies. But if you wanted to just experiment, you could go to your hardware store and get one of these privacy films, yep. like I have on that window right there, because yep. it's right by the right by the road. Um, yeah, you can go to like Lowe's and you can get the diamond plate stuff. Yeah. I mean, you can put it on there and it will do almost the same thing. It just really diffuses it too so much. So is that still an option that you offer with your lights? No, I um, I don't off offer that anymore. I thought about bringing it back, but everybody wanted to see the LEDs. Um, and they wanted more shimmer. So I kind of just got rid of it again. And that's that, but I may bring it back. It's funny um, because there's always like a vocal minority, yeah. right? And then... The, the, the in manufacturers and the industry kind of shifts to try to appease those because they think that a lot of people are, want that, they're just not saying so. Yeah. And then you go to the diffuser and then you have a new vocal minority who are like, oh, I want my shiver lines. But I, you know what, I think that should be an option. Yeah. I think that should be an option for sure. They may come back, it's yeah. easy to do. Very cool. Um, so, I, don't, I just don't want to dive right into the Nanbox Reef catalog, so we'll just kind of no, no, we'll, we'll yeah. go in and we'll come out. We'll go in and come out. So, briefly tell us about some of the different fixtures that you have available, um, excluding your hybrids and your retrofits, because we'll get to that. So how many fixtures, uh, models, do you have like this? So there's three models of this one. So that's the Mini. It's a five inches by three by, say, a little bit less than an inch. And then there's the Duo, which is a 12 inch unit. Um, that has two clusters in there, same look and everything. And then there's the quad, which is a 24 inch unit, um, with four clusters, 24 inch by three by the same dimensions. Um, everything comes with a gooseneck, easy to mount up and also wireless connectivity. So you just plug it in, sync it up to the app and then that's it. Um, and then the only other real product line I have that isn't custom is a retro line. But not, not yet, because okay, okay. I want to segue into that. Okay. So one thing that's that's neat about these these fixtures um, is you have a single, you have the double, yep. and you have, you have a quad? The quad, yeah. The four. quad. And that's four in a row. Yep. So it's almost like a strip. Um, but the smaller fixtures, you can get different colored housings of the unibody. This unibody is so nice. There's yep. still nobody that makes anything <laughs> like this. You can get different colored uh, lids. Yep. You can get a bunch of different lids and change with the seasons. Yeah. Stainless um, steel, wood. 
the, 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 is it the solo? Or is that just the tight as the, the one? So I call this the mini. So okay, the mini is a single. single. Yep. Okay. So the, the mini and the duo are available with the gooseneck on the, on the side? So it's just on this side now. Um, I can drill from this side for... Are you not also. making that stock anymore? No, because no. they're milled this way. So ah, okay, okay, you okay, just okay. have a random hole. But you can also get this um, without the gooseneck, right? Correct. Right. Yep. And, and then you have what? It's like just a soft cable like this? Yep. Does it come out this hole? Comes out the same hole. And then you can also suspend it. So I have a, a white fixture that you can see on his Instagram yep. um, uh, that is suspended. So there's no gooseneck. Because for some, some, for some tanks, for some applications, just having that floating light just, just looks better. Just looks so cool. Yeah. And without and, thin the profile. And, and for some other tanks, it's just really convenient yep. to just have this clip on. And uh, goosenecks, you were also first. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That Kessel might have been right there with you. Yeah, I think it was right, right there the with time. you. Yeah. But those are spotlights. Those are not fixtures. Yeah. You were the first fixture with the goosenecks. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right. You guys cannot. You guys are not asking enough enough questions, that's for sure. Um, let's see what else we have. Okay, so so the other thing that's really cool, and, and something that doesn't really get a lot of um, airtime for your product line, is um, retrofits. I understand, you know, you started with a DIY. You yep. plugged into the Nano Reef community. Um, you probably, um, do you have a sponsored forum on Nanobox? On Nano Reef. NanoReef.com? Yep. Yeah, okay, so you can definitely um, hit him up anytime on NanoReef.com. Yeah. But, LEDs have always had a strong foot in DIY. Yeah. Right? Very simple. And so the all in one nano reefs have always been DIY. First, you know, just to take out whatever crappy pre LED light yep. that they had to put small HUI lights, small uh, T5, small power PCs, compacts. Yeah. And LEDs went straight in that direction. So um, do you offer a retrofit kit for some of those all in ones? Yeah, so I, I offer. Um Retro kits for like bio cubes, uh, all the all-in-one tanks. Um, really simple. You just literally rip everything out and then put the new stuff in. By rip everything out, he means you just yeah. screw a couple of things and you carefully take out a couple of wires. Yeah. But it goes in there. We don't. Yeah. It's it's really simple. And then everything's inside the hood. You don't have to worry about anything being external except for the power supply, which you know will, will go just like with everything else that you have on your uh, on your tank. So really simple. Um, Priced really fairly, and it, the units are already complete. So all you have to do is just mount them into the hood. You don't have to solder. You don't have to do anything like that. And um, that's that. But yeah, those have been really, really successful for me. And um, you know what? So one thing that's funny is that metal halides, T5s, and other fluorescents were king before LEDs came around. Yep. And I always thought that we'd see like this, this, this gradient. This movement, this sh this gradual shift, where we did halides with LEDs, T5s with LEDs, power compacts with LEDs, but definitely at least in the West, at least in America, it was like this mentality that LEDs are new, they're better, they're more efficient, and everybody went straight LED yeah. before we knew how to use them, how to work them, and um, we totally skipped over the entire hybrid light phase that we should have had. Everybody went all in. But I feel like the pendulum is swinging back the other way. It has been for a couple of years. Yep. Where people are exp experimenting and playing more with using T5s and LEDs. Um, so you don't make a fixture, but it, it, if I remember, remember correctly, do you do a little bit of custom work? Yeah. Okay, tell us about your, some of your custom fixtures because these are so cool. Yeah, so you take some of the best T5 fixtures yep. on the market, and you make it even better. Tell, tell the people how. This is yeah. one of the favorite, my favorite things. So, you know, T5 units, they're great, they're very efficient, um, but just adding that LED to it goes a long way. So what I actually do, um, it's mostly on Sun Power, so ATI, they make a great T5 unit. Um, in my opinion, probably the best one out there. So what we do is take a good unit, make it a little bit better. Um, basically break it apart, take out two of the tubes, uh, the T5 tubes, and then you put the nanobox arrays going in two different rows or a single row, depending on how big the tank is. Um, the nice thing about it is there's no, there's nothing else external. So again, everything's internal inside the unit. So, so then you just get kind of like the best of both worlds, I think, for tanks. And we're talking about nanos, but in my opinion, T5 LED combo is the best for larger tanks. 
It's the easiest way to light one up for a good price. Um, LEDs can definitely light a large tank. It just takes a lot of lights. Yeah, so you know, there's definitely this, like, this idea that we should be focusing on a single PAR number. Yeah. And that's if we grew two-dimensional corals. Our corals are three-dimensional. And so, you know, 500 PAR is not going to grow your corals faster. 500 PAR coming from a point source yeah. is, gonna, is not going to be nearly as good as 250 micromoles of PAR coming from every direction. Yep. You know, so this is something that we need to re-educate ourselves about, like kind of like three-dimensionality yep. of light. So, so yeah, T5 and LED is uh, one of the best combinations you can get. You fill in the light, you get um, like some of the extra warmth mm -hmm. and some of the extra pinks that you wouldn't really see with LEDs. And one thing that, that is invisible is that fluorescent lights are UV lights. Yep. You take away all the phosphors that makes them color, they're UV lights. And so T5s are basically UV pumps, just a very small amount, but it's very diffused. Which you need, yeah. Yeah, and, and so together, the T5s and the LEDs, um, man, that is just a power, power combo. Yeah. You can use, um, you know, instead of just using, you see a lot of uh, just royal blue LEDs in these T5 fixtures. I really think you need the whole spectrum too, because it's only going to work together um, with the T5s as well. You're, you're going to fill in those small gaps that maybe you only have two or three clusters of LEDs and they're not going to hit every point and then you just have two T5s on the sides and it just fills in those extra spots that maybe the LEDs aren't hitting but you're still getting that crazy color out you know the LED royals or blues or cyans so very yeah. cool yeah so great clusters great lights um, I love your custom work and the retro work uh, now box reef is not just these fixtures yeah. if you've got a unique uh, project hit them up um, the company's growing as recently um, Carrot picked up by Marine Depot, right? Yeah, so Marine Depot just recently picked me up a couple weeks ago. So that's very all there. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Awesome. They've been a huge help. So. Yeah. And you know, if you want a really stylish nano or refugium light, you make freshwater versions of this light too, right? Yep. So, so there's no reason you couldn't take the freshwater version and put it on your fuge if you wanted to. Macro algae. Yeah. Macro algae. Macro <laughs> algae. Um, okay, so so we went into the deep end. We're gonna pull back a little bit, just a little yeah. bit. Um, so what are your, some of your favorite corals from nanotanks? And you guys tell us in the comments, what are your favorite corals from nanotanks? Because I got my idea for some of my favorites from nanotanks. What are some of your favorite corals from nanotanks? Favorite corals, uh, one being a, I go figure I'm a lighting guy, but doesn't really need lighting as a, or you know the scientific name, dendros. Uh, yeah, yeah, dendrophilias, yeah. I love those in nanotanks because I think you can, you can feed them easier than you can in large tanks, they're right there. Um, Flower anemones. Flower anemones. Yep. Flower anemones are absolutely on there. They're yep. perfect. Um, micros. Ah, uh, yes. Um, this, is, this includes the corals formerly known as acan lords. Yep. Exactly. It's just called lords now. But yeah, you can just have a small little two, three frags about this big, size of a quarter. Yep. And when it's happy, it just puffs up into just a nice little hemisphere. Exactly. A flash that kind of, you know, is flapping. That's a good one. They don't grow too fast. They don't sting stuff. Yep. What else is on your list? Um, one of my favorites are Fabios. Oh, really? I love Fabios. I have a bunch. I mean, I love Fabios. I'm just yeah. thinking in the nano context. Yeah. It's not first on my list. It's. I think for me, um, there's really beautiful strains out there now, and they grow pretty quickly. Um, so they can kind of crust over a rock or, um, you know, it, what it, they do all those different sculptures now where they put like a skull or something. I mean, even that would be kind of gnarly having Did you notice my sculpture upstairs? Yeah, the uh, tiki head. Or yeah, whatever. it's a, a Moai yeah. sculpture. Um, it's been going on for two years. It's almost completely covered. I think another three to six months, yeah. you won't be able to tell anything. Because it's not it's not Cyphastria that, that it crusts very closely. It's not mm -hmm. it's Cyphastria. That's another really, really good one. And there's some really cool strains. Like so Bizarro. many cool strains. Bizarro, right Bizarro now, is my yeah. favorite. Yep. That's, yeah. that's one thing I'm missing. I don't have a single Cyphastria yeah. in this tank. i got to find me some, Cy some Bizarro. That again. and the um, Meteor Shower yeah. version. Which is just that one's, iconic, I think. That one's but. iconic, but it's also classic, and it's also borderline invasive. Yeah, it grows <laughs> super quick. It will just... It just throws skin on everything, yep. and then the, the skeleton comes, and it's, oh, next thing you know, it's like all over your, your power head or whatever. Yeah, and I think, uh, all right, one more. I really like, um, like, monopore caps, in a neck, which is weird, but I like seeing some type of cap or, like, cup in a tank. And this is all over the place, um, but I've seen some nano tanks 
Uh, one of the ones that Reef Builders featured, um, Teeny Reef John. Yeah. did it like a year ago or so. He had a couple, you know, for a nano tank to have a, a little colony of a cap like this big inside of a 10 gallons. Pretty big. You need a high light to keep it tight. Yep. You know, if you did a medium light, it would just go flat and hit exactly. the walls real quick. So his started to turn and everything. But yeah, those are. Those are kind of my like go-tos. Um, I really enjoy those. Matter. Sure. Yeah. So we could we definitely uh, overlapped with the lords. Yep. Um, definitely flower names was like super high on my list. Um, right along with those for me would be candies, Calastria. You know because you can have ten little coralite heads in a small space about this big. It's it's just it's like a mini lobophilia at that point. Yeah. You got greens. You got green mouth. You got striped raggy. So candies out there. Um, Right along the same lines as the uh, flower nymphs is uh, Ricordias. Oh, yeah. Come on, Ricordias. Because regular shrooms grow really fast, but Ricordias are usually manageable. If you've got Ricordias growing gangbusters, that's a good problem to have, mm -hmm. especially if you have a very fancy Caribbean or Pacific Ricordia. Yeah. Um, what's another one? Large pallies. Not your regular crossing zoanthids, but your large palithoagramus. I can see a cluster right there, yeah. and I have like a patch in my tank upstairs. The only thing is, they're very toxic, so I have three clusters on a um, magnet. Okay. Whenever, they get, whenever they get big, I can pull that whole magnet out, yep. trim it outside the tank, and put it back. Um, got those. Would you say, since you like Recordia, would Yuma? Yeah, or yeah, so it, yeah. Yuma would be okay. one of those, just cool. because it'll be kind of showy. It, and if it gets big enough, it'll feel like an anemone in your tank. Yep. Obviously, it's not an anemone. It's not quite that big. Um, it, was there any good ones in the comments? Uh, space Monster. Oh, the um, Space Invader. Uh, I, you know what? I would veto the Space Invader Pectinia Same. because as soon as that thing is happy, it's going to have sweepers for yeah. days. Um, that's true. So yeah, th that's a, that's a good little cluster of uh, of corals for uh, for nano tanks. Yeah, I can't really. I'm like looking at my tank right over here to see if I really missed anything. Yeah, but I, I love your answer though earlier about how what's different about nano tanks. They're intimate. They're close. You yeah. know, you're looking at everything real closely. Let's see, right um, favorite fish for nano tanks? Or did you have a question? Sorry, I've been like no, you uh, <laughs> covering you know, the bases. Well, no, let, let's talk about fish, and I'll ask you, you know, maybe we can roll back on, like, practices of what you do for nano tanks versus what I do. Yeah. Um, and maybe what you guys do out there, you guys can... You're nursing that beer, man. I, it's almost done. Okay. You know, you, we're we're basically, something? we have two yeah. more beers, and then, then we're going to wrap up this, this discussion. Yeah. It's a beer-limited uh, Q&A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but no, nano fish. Um, shrimp gobies or... You know, something that pairs up so really nice. well with a, a pistol shrimp or whatnot. Um, Any of the Watchman gobies. Yes. Yeah. Not sleeper gobies, because they get a little bit bigger. Yep. Um, and what we were talking about, mask gobies. Um, yeah. Yeah. Evoda, or Eviotas. Eviotas. Eviotas and Trimos. Yeah, those are always great. Um, they can be really fun seeing them dart in and out of stuff. And... Plec Tranthius. <laughs> Geometric Pygmy Hawk. Oh yes. Like the one I have yep. over there. I've got this too. The common little twenty dollar guy. It's like it's like having a hawkfish, but any other hawkfish is gonna get big. Yep. It's gonna eat shrimp, it's gonna mess with stuff, it's gonna be aggressive, but a little geometric pick me hawk, it's gonna max out like inch and three quarters. Yeah. You know, two inches if you count with the longest extension of the tail, stay on the ground, they won't jump. Yep. Um, I wish they came out a little bit more during the day. You don't see them out all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think mine's Maybe it's just scary. It might be a brightness thing too. Yeah. It might be a brightness. You have the real bright lights, you might just hang, hang back. Um, 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 neon gobies are super good. You know, there's so many freaking gobies. Yeah. Um, some of the small cardinal fish. You know, there's a lot of cool fish that are great for nanos that we just don't get. Yeah. We just don't get it. What was that craze for a while? The uh, that red and blue stripe cardinal. They were really small, these, or maybe just the blue stripe. I think uh, blue, I think in blue stripe. Yeah. And then there's like like the glass cardinal fish. Well, of course, glass cardinal. Real tiny. Those are really cool. Real karma is great, but this is a, it's, it's a sizable fish. You know, you're gonna yeah. get three inches plus on that. So. Oh, here's um, a good one. If you have 25 gallons plus, real karmas. Uh, I love real karmas and small damselfish, small dotty backs. Um, what was a good one? 
we got one of, one of the guys, uh, Dave Zando tanks. Um, Tailspot Tail Tail one. Yeah, there's just all, I have one. Yep. So many cool little nanogobies. Yep. Absolutely. But he's just a fun, personal, they look cool. Very so, cool. Oh yeah, the green banded goby. That's another one. All right, so, um, your turn. Why don't you flip the script here and see what's up? Yeah, so I guess I've known you for six-ish years now, and I think the first time I saw you, I, I had this vision of like going over to Jake's house and his tanks were going to look like what I always see with everything else, but you do things a little bit differently. Um, for nano tanks, because you've had a lot, or what I consider nano tanks, maybe not you, but you, uh, you've had a bunch of different types. What are like... I guess some of your like common practices with your nanos, like a little bit of maintenance, like the video that you showed, do you just do one so the, large water change here and there? So, so the thing is, in a large reef tank, um, you know, salt water is expensive, yep. right? And you want a big stable environment um, and you don't want to mess with it too much. And that's why we test the water and uh, use adsorbers to clean the water because the seawater is expensive yep. um, and we dose. But in a small tank, a very small tank, you know, take 10, 15 gallons. You just, just change five gallons, change 10 gallons. And it's so important to, to, to master your salinity because all of the salt mixes, all of them are, are freaking perfect. They, everything's measured out beforehand. And so people who have problems with alkalinity or calcium and magnesium, they don't have problems with those things. They're just not measuring the salinity right. Yeah. They're measuring the specific gravity. They're not going the extra step realizing the specific gravity gives you a salinity at a set temperature. So you make good seawater yep. at, 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 at a known salinity. At, virtually every salt mix is going to give you that 420 to 450 salt. It's going to give you 1300 plus magnesium. It's going to give you 8 to 9 DTKH yep. in alkalinity and all the traces you could ever want. So yeah, you know, uh, definitely in 2009 or 2010, when I was sharing my Eco Reef uh, 1 and Eco Reef 0 concepts, yeah. where I didn't have any live rock, I didn't have any sand, and I would just do 99% water changes about once a month, no water testing, and I just spent so much time just enjoying the tank. Yeah, I think like, uh, and like you said, or it comes back to the being intimate with your tank, if you just do a water change, everything's so small, if something's screwing up or not looking good, you can react a whole lot quicker than say a large tank. Um, or sometimes some corals just won't, you know, I don't think. Yeah, don't freak out about. fix everything. Right, don't know? freak out about one coral that's not doing a well in a population of a hundred, yep. you know? So in my tank, if one coral's pissed off, I'm like, that's tough, <laughs> yeah. you better pull through. I will pay attention to you, but I'm not gonna fix everything. So along those lines, not a reef key, keeping is a completely different art form. Yeah. You're really shooting yourself in the foot if you set up a nano reef tank with a giant skimmer, crazy pumps, very bright lights, all the test kits, all the dosing, like that's, that's you're missing the point. Yeah. You so know, I feel like if you're under 30 gallons, you should have no test kits. You should uh, maybe do very light dosing. I'd say if any test kit, just have salinity. Because if you're doing some stuff. Alkalinity is a, well. Yeah. Salinity goes without saying. Yeah. Got to have a good refractometer of some kind. Yeah. Alkalinity is an important one. So yeah. maybe that one I, I, think would, that's I would include. One yeah. I see people, you know, I'm really interactive on Nano Reef, and I see a lot of people like, hey, my alkalinity is like 13. Like, yeah, there's going to be some problems. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're working with a lot there. Um, and then you see it as low as five. Like, yeah, I don't think that's going to work out too well. But I agree. Yeah. Those two would be the ones weekly. Um, the, but the point is that you should be nano reefing. Yeah. If you have a nano reef, you should be nano reefing. Don't pay attention to what the big boys are doing in their giant tanks and how much money they're spending yeah. on all the things you don't need. You know, recognize and embrace what a nano reef tank is. See, we got one of the followers. My life story. <laughs> freak out. <laughs> don't freak out. Yeah. Yeah. Reef loco. Yeah, don't freak out. Uh, you know, I remember picking up that tidbit in a, a random presentation at a talk where this guy was talking about, hey, if you have a hundred corals and two or three of the corals are pissed off, they're just sissies. Yeah. <laughs> they're just sissies. They have personal issues. Just enjoy their whole reef tank yep. and move on with your life. They'll be fine. Yeah, or, or not. Sort of. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Very cool. Water changes in nano. So just make sure yeah. your salinity's on point and your temperature's on point. That's a pretty good one. Yeah, and then um, kind of going off of what you do is kind of a little bit different than what I do. Like. Um, 
your style of nano tanks, like it's almost like sometimes it's an experiment where you're doing different things where I think I consider Jake one of the first people and I'm sure there's other people who did it but like magnets on the back I'm addicted so with Jake's nano tanks he can go into it more but he he doesn't use much rock at all mm -hmm. um, very very minimal but then you also see where he wants more I like guess coral real estate you see these magnets that you're people may not see that often. You see these like, uh, what's the company? There's a company out there that makes like a magnet with a rock. Oh, alternative on. Reef. Yeah, Alternative Reef makes one. That's what my Galaxies have covered over there. Oh, okay. You can't even so tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it just looks like Galaxia floating. But I think that's always been a cool idea, but I guess why is that, did you just want more real estate for it? Or? A couple things. Yeah. You're a tall dude. Yep. I'm a tall dude. When I'm looking at a tank, usually I'm looking at kind of a downward angle. Exactly. Right? And so late 90s, early 2000s, People were filling their tanks with rock. And the rock would go all the way up to the top because our lights were dim. And we're trying to get the corals up to the top. But then the corals are at the top and they have to punch over to kind of see the top of the coral. We all know that top down shot is the best way to look at the corals. Yep. So over time, you know, none of my reefscape reach much above halfway. Okay. You know, that one's about two thirds, right? Like yep. the top is coral because I'm looking downwards. Yep. Um, and my nano tank is a little bit upstairs is an extreme example because it's like low to the ground. It's like 14 so, inches off the floor. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at it mostly from a top-down point of view. Um, so the first reason was aesthetic. Second reason is I want more room for coral. Yep. I just want more room for coral. There's less rock in the tank. Um, it's not going to block the flow. It's not going to trap detritus. Um, it's not going to trap pests and parasites. You know, yep. all the aptasia and flatworms and mojados and things that we can get. And um, yeah, if you know, if you have a surface, if you're, if every surface of your tank is hypothetically covered in coral, algae can't grow. Yeah. There's nowhere true. left for algae to grow. It's not going to grow on the coral. Yeah. So, so yeah, in my my tanks, it's just just enough rock to uh, uh, to hold the corals. And as I get more corals, I usually pull out, you know, maybe another ten to twenty percent of the rock. Okay. Over the next year or two, as the you know I'm growing with the aquascape. How do you do your nano cool. tanks? I'm in the same boat. Um, I like very minimal rock work, but I also like to only do a few specific corals on each rock because uh, I really enjoy seeing everything grow. Um, I think that's one of the coolest things of nano tanks is you get to appreciate how quick things grow, maybe then a little bit different than a large tank because everything looks so big. You have these rocks that are as big as a nano, um, and then instead, you know, you have a small rock, you buy a small frag with say five or six polyps or heads, whatever you want to call it, eyes, and you can see it over time really grow. Mm -hmm. So I, I like the minimal rock work. Um, I like minimal rock work above, and if you're running a sump, um, as well, nothing in there in my opinion. Like, I just literally put two power heads in there, stir up all the junk that gets caught down there. Um, but yeah, across the board, everything's minimal. Uh, yeah. my tank so that's how I like it yeah you know um, the, just the, the, the thing to drive home is that you know keeping a nano reef and don't read a book about coral reefing uh, aquariums um, and apply that to your nano tanks you know we've got a whole new school of mm -hmm. nano reefing and um, you know it's different it's it's own thing yeah um, you know one thing that's really uh, kind of surprised me is I've been doing a wide variety of videos yeah. on the channel big tanks small tanks fish stores wild reefs on the nano reef tanks, people love seeing all the different ways. One of the cool things that's cool about um, nano tanks is the, the ability to trick them out. Oh yeah, you know, you, it. Most of us are not rich, right? I mean, some people out there mm -hmm. are, but most of them are not rich. But so you can, you know, you can have a, a pimp my ride nano tank versus a large, large, large tank. Yeah. Some large aquariums, the glass itself is like five to ten nano reef tanks. Exactly. If if not well more than that. But no, uh, one other question I want to ask you too for your practices. So in the last nano video you did, um, you had like a, basically for the surface scum, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not running any, if you're not running a sump, if you're not running a, uh, you know, external filter or anything, do you just, I mean, you said you just scoop it out. Is there any other <laughs> tricks or? To be honest, so. Because you like seeing it from the top down. So, you so, so one of the, the other things that's really important about my philosophy in nano reefing, I don't keep fish. 
Okay. I may have a fish in there. Mm -hmm. The fish is an afterthought. Yeah. I keep showy shrimp. Yeah. I keep a Zanzibar shrimp. I keep a blue coral banded shrimp. I keep a gold coral banded shrimp. I will have some other funky shrimps in there. Yeah. And they don't. I don't feed the tank. I'll target feed the corals, and I'll plan that to be a few days before water change. Okay. So first of all, I'm not adding a lot of proteins to the water. I'm not adding a lot of scum to the water. So that film does build up slowly. Yeah. Um, ideally, I'd love the perfect power head that had a surface, you know, subsurface. So ideally, I kind of put the outlet to kind of ripple the surface. Yep. Um, when my nana took upstairs, you saw there's no surface agitation. Yeah. Also, don't have any fish. I don't have very high oxygen requirements. Yep. Um, so what's interesting is as the film builds up, I will um, I'll take a credit card. I'll just kind of wave it across the top, okay. and those those protein bits, they go two places. They go in the coral mouths, yeah. and they go straight into the protein skimmer. Yep. And it's funny because when I do it, it like it looks like kind of like a snowstorm. There's um, a... If if it's been a while since I've done it, I will literally just take a you know, kind of a wide mouth container and just uh, siphon off just the surface, and then I, I have seawater made up, and I can just scoop that out, and scoop it in. But I'm a reefer, and I'm always like paying attention to my tips. Yeah. You know, and I'm always here. So I, one trick that I did. Oh yeah, I like, tricks. Yeah, we want just, tricks. Yeah. And this sounds really weird, but it, it works really well. Is I just get, depending how long your tank is, uh, paper towels, paper towel. and you just barely set it over top. Yeah. And it just sucks up the stuff, and you pull out real quick, and it's clean again. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's no, like a, a bounty commercial. It's gone. So a lot of people have this idea that things have to be super automated. Yeah. And super automatic. Uh, that's not me. You know, it's a hobby. It's, it's a hands on. Mat. Yeah, it's a cheap <laughs> roll of that. But yeah, so yeah, I've actually, back in the day, I've done that with really small freshwater tanks. But like, oh man, there's real thick scum. Yeah. Absolutely have done that trick before. Awesome. For sure. All right, man, I think we've covered all the bases. I don't know if we need to finish these beers. Look at this. Um, they like the bounty trick. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I know this was a little bit late for that many people to tune yeah. in. Um, but, uh, you know, we're going to be around. We're buddies. We're hanging out. Um, so yeah, definitely subscribe to the channel if you uh, are new to the channel. We post a lot of great stuff on the Reef Builders video YouTube channel. Um, Dave has a very healthy um, social media presence. Uh, Instagram. Yeah. Facebook. Facebook. Nano Reef. For forum on Nano Reef. Yeah. You got a website, nanoboxreef.com. Yep. We're going to put all of that stuff in the description. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I think there's a little bit more of an ideal time for the international viewers. I know yeah. we got a few uh, uh, good days from Australia. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's great to have you. I'm glad we have this discussion. Nano reefs are bomb. Yes. They're, and it, it's a totally different art form. If you watch this more video all the way through, that's the one thing I want to you know, relate to you guys. A nano reef is not the same as a regular reef. And together, we're going to keep spreading that gospel. Yeah. So. And I think one of the... I wanna, one thing that really influenced me from Reef Builders, I think you guys should check out, You there's an article on doing like different biotopes yeah. for nano reefs. And that really will get some like gears rolling if you read that again. It's an old article, but it was a fun one that you did, I thought. Or okay. Someone, and it had all these different ideas, and I think it will get you guys going too, because it definitely did with me uh, like a year ago. Yeah, so we've so. talked about a lot of things in this video. Yeah. We're gonna put a, a, a bounty of links in the description, Sounds. so definitely check that out. Um, thanks to everybody for, for tuning in, and uh, yeah, much love to the reefing community out there. Nanobox Reef Lights are the bomb. Definitely check them out on Nanobox Reef. Check it out, guys. Reefs. Yeah. And uh, we'll talk to you guys another time. Yep. All right, bye guys. See you guys.